what we're doing this semester in both imaging and radiobiology have uh, the, the understanding of those things have roots in image create or X-ray creation and control of X-ray beam. Right, so you have to understand control of the X-ray beam and what's happening as we change our technical factors and what happens inside of the patient for radiobiology, but also what comes through the patient in the remnant beam and how that affects the uh, image receptor image creation. So we're going to go back through it. Certainly we're not going to take all semester, but we'll, we'll take a couple of weeks and uh, talk about those things. Uh, we're planting seeds too. We're going to talk about KVP, but we're going to talk about KVP in context of what we're going to get into later in the semester. So there's going to be a little bit of redundancy in this semester too. So going all the way back to the imaging system, uh, we identified the imaging system in a couple of different ways. If you remember, um, there were two different ways, and that was use, right, and then energy that we create in that particular imaging system. So what are examples of usage? You see in uh, certain rooms, you can do two different things. Fluoro. Fluoro and radiography. So it's RF room, right? So, um, you know, you, you can ferret that out and, and make different things out of it too, like uh, portable, but it's portable radiography still, right? Uh, MAMO is still diagnostic x-ray. It's its own specialty, but it's, it's still diagnostic x-rays. So that, that would be usage, but also in the energy that we create. So most of our x-ray units that you use won't go above 150 kbp. Most of them won't, or some of them won't even go that high. And certainly we don't use the, the highest kbp that it can produce, the highest x-ray beam that you've created is what? What's the highest KVP you set? 110, 120, right? <clears throat> so we don't max those out, but their identification is, is either by usage or by, uh, by energy level, or really kind of a little bit of both, like those diagnostic uh, machines, you're not gonna get 100 KVP out of them. Or, I'm sorry, a mammography machine, you're not going to get 100 kbp out of it. So we talked about the couch, uh, the, the tabletop. What were the characteristics of the tabletop? Radiolucent. Radiolucent. Had to be radiolucent, right? It doesn't do us any good to put the image receptor under the tabletop if the tabletop's radiopaque, right? So it's got to be radiolucent so x-rays go through it. But radiolucency means what? What does it mean? What's that? Minimal absorption. Min okay, very good. Minimal, but what's the second word? Absorption. absorption, right. So it does absorb, you know, something that, that is radiolucent does absorb, but it doesn't absorb at a high rate, right? So since it does absorb, since the, the table is going to absorb some x-rays, we have to have it not only radiolucent, but it's also, it has to have a uniform thickness. If we're thicker in spots than other spots, what we're going to have on the image are artifacts. The artifacts can cover up pathologies, right? Things that we need to see. So characteristics of the couch is it has to be radiolucent and it has to be uniform thickness. We talked about the different types of couch. You know, we, we had the, the tabletops that are recessed, right? And we talked about the benefits of those last semester. Um, and that was that we lowered the OID and uh, by lowering the OID, we reduced magnification and reduced unsharpness. <clears throat> I know that's a double negative, but reduced unsharpness. We increased sharpness for recorded detail by using those. The, the flat tabletops, uh, the benefit to those were that if you were doing decubitus images, you, you had less of a likelihood to get the, the table, and especially the support systems of the table on the image, right? So, uh, benefits to both of those. What were the principal parts of the imaging system? <laughs> you had three, essentially. One was that place where you punch the buttons. Was that? Operating console. Operating console, exactly. Operating console. That's where you control everything. Uh, you control your KVP, your MA, the photo cells you use, which bucky you're using. It controls everything, right? Focal spot size, all of that stuff is, is where you control or you're, you control that from the operator's console. OK, 
Okay, so you got the console. X-ray tube. tube, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good to have a, an operating console without an X-ray tube. The X-ray tube is in the room, obviously creating the X-rays. And then you have to have something to create that high energy, right? So you have to have the, the high voltage um, uh, circuitry. Uh, and they, they call it the high voltage transfer. All right, so the console is where we control everything. That's your, your MA and, and time separately to create your mass, your KVP, um, and that, that will be in your quantity. Now, remember, uh, we've got two different things. We've got quantity and we have quality. And the quantity, for the most part, uh, almost everything affects the quantity of x-rays that you create. But what we use to control that quantity is one thing, and that is your mass, right? But uh, just kind of running back through this from last semester, whenever we, we change our KVP, what happens when we change our KVP? If you can visualize a brim spectrum and where we left off last semester, and we'll draw this probably on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday. But um, what happened as we increased KVP? Speed. The speed of the, the electrons traveling across the tube. So we've, we get a lot of stuff of changing KVP. Right? So you, you change the speed of the electrons that travel across the tube. The kinetic energy of those electrons increases so that whenever they hit that target, they have a lot of energy to lose. Right? The more energy you have to lose, the higher your brim spectrum is going to be. Right? The higher the energy of the brim spectrum. But you can have multiple interactions and, and lose energy, effectively lose all of the energy, but what you get in that is an increase in quantity. You remember last semester we talked about if you change your KVP by 15%, it equates to how much of a change in intensity at the image receptor. It's a factor of? Two. 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 Right, right. So it's, uh, you get a, an increase in quantity as well. So uh, back to the Bram spectrum, if you remember when, when I drew that out, what you get in the Bram spectrum was that elongated bell curve, right? So what we got with the increase in KVP was an increase in numbers, right? And increase in, in the high energy numbers too, right? So we get a, a dramatic increase in quantity, uh, but primarily what we, cons or what we equate KVP to is an increase in quality. So why do we call it quality? Why do we consider it quality? What are we trying to accomplish with an X-ray? What does it have to do? Penetrate. Penetrate. Right. So if your x-ray beam is low enough energy or so low of energy that it can't penetrate through the patient, what good does it do you? Nothing. Nothing. Right? So the higher the KVP goes, the more penetration you get and the higher the quality of the x-ray beam. Um, we'll talk about this here in a minute, but remember that, that, that it is a measure of quality. It's not the definitive measure of quality. Right? We had something else that, that we um, said was the, the better measure of quality. So the other things that we consider, or other things that we can control, or are controlled, some we don't control at all, at the, the console are uh, line voltage, photocells, generator type, focal spot selection, filtration. We'll talk about most of those, or mentioned most of those already, except for line voltage. What was that? And it's really line voltage compensation. You remember? Keeps it steady. Bingo. It's, it's like, a, I don't really want to say just a surge protector as much as it is a uh, kind of like a battery backup type thing for your computer. Constant. Um, it, it evens out not only the, the surges, the upward surges, but also the downward surges. So it takes your voltage and it fixes it so that you feed uh, the right amount of voltage into your auto transformer, right? That was the only thing in the circuit that we drew that came off before the auto transformer, right? We fixed the, uh, the line volt voltage before it got into the, the auto transformer, right? So then we had the photocells. What are the photocells? It's when you are... Your automatic exposure, right? So uh, you push the button that says chest x-ray and it selects your photocells. 
Um, you can turn that off or you can set it by yourself instead of instead of pushing a button that says chest x-ray you can set that yourself so that you can select the photo cells uh, even if you just push push the button that says chest x-ray it selects them for you so theoretically you're selecting those um, you can't change generator type you can't really control that from the the control panel your generator type is your generator type so if you're working off of a three-phase machine you're working off a three-phase machine you're not going to change it Right? But you certainly can select your focal spot. Again, if you're using uh, you know, automatically programmed radiography where you push the button and it gives you all of your technical factors, it will select your, photos, your focal spot for you. But you can, there is a button on your control panel where you can change that, right? So uh, the button kind of looks like you've got two different buttons, one for large and one for small focal spot and one button has a big square in it and the other button has a small square in it. It's large and small focal spot. Um, <clears throat> you know, we don't really control filtration at this point either. We'll talk about the different types of filtration. Uh, filtration for the most part is set. I'm not real sure why I included it here, but uh, filtration is, is pretty much set. Uh, I have worked up with a couple of machines where you could change the, filter, the, the type of filter that you were using in the collimator housing. Uh, but you just don't see that on all machines. Um, <clears throat> certainly you can use added filtration, and we'll talk about those, the, the effects of added filtration during the semester. So line voltage compensation, again, fixes everything. You don't control that. It's automatic. Uh, the only time that you will ever see controls for line voltage compensation is if you're working on a single phase machine. You're never going to see it otherwise. So if you're working in a, a small uh, limited exposure doctor's office, you may see that. Um, otherwise, it's just built into the circuitry. It's there, but you don't have to do anything with it. All right, <clears throat> so KBP manipulation. So what we're going to talk about is uh, what it is that we use to manipulate the KBP and where, where we find that and what it works off of. We'll talk about the, the construction of that thing, um, what kind of current it, it uh, involves, and all these are registry testable, um, what law that works off of, what we're adjusting, and uh, the, back to the, the uh, number of coils, uh, what we can say about the turns ratio um, as we increase or decrease the turns ratio, what we get, and then uh, how we measure the, the voltage that's coming out of that thing. So. KBP, <clears throat> what are the, the different names that we have for KBP? What do we call it? We call it KBP, but what else? Rheostat. What's that? A rheostat. Re okay, that, where we control the KBP. Oh, yeah, you, yeah. You're not incorrect. <laughs> uh, where we control the KBP is at the auto transformer, which we call rheostat. But the KBP itself we call electric potential, potential right? A potential difference. Um, and it, it controls the, the electrostatic charge between the cathode and the anode of the x-ray tip. So we adjust that at the auto transformer, which is the rheostat, right? Um, and it, uh, it, we don't have KVP until we get to the step-up transformer. Now, everything that we can have before the step-up transformer, step-up transformer is where we create the KVP, right? So the very high voltage. Everything that we can have before the step-up transformer, we want to have before the step-up transformer for safety, right? We don't want to be dealing with 100,000 volts. We'd rather be dealing with 220, 240 volts, right? So we're going to have everything that we can have on the low, relative speaking, low voltage side. So it's going to be found in, on the primary side of the step-up transformer. It works off relatively low voltage. So we adjust KVP before we have KVP, right? So we adjust KVP before it becomes KVP, but we call it KVP because if we have it set right, if our machine is, if our contacts are, are made in the right place, um, more on that in a second, but if, if we have everything right before we feed it into the high voltage transformer, we know what's gonna come out of the high voltage transformer based on what we feed it, right? So we'll go back up to uh, this thing. Uh, so we use the auto transformer to adjust our voltage. Uh, how many coils do we have on auto transformer? 
One. Only one, right? So uh, it works off of self-induction, right? So that we feed it what kind of current? I kind of gave you a hint with this. Alternating current, right? We feed it alternating current. Alternating current creates a changing magnetic field. Very good. Changing magnetic field so that if we make contacts on the primary side of the auto transformer and we'll put contacts in exactly the same spot on the secondary side of the auto transformer, then what's our, our voltage leaving the auto transformer compared to coming into it? No change, right? But if we spread them out, then what happens to our voltage? It goes up. If we squeeze them in, it goes down, right? So, um, <clears throat> so uh, what we can say about the turns ratio is if the turns on the secondary side are greater than the turns on the primary side, then our voltage is going to go up. If the turns are fewer on the secondary side, it's going to go down, right? So what we're actually doing when we adjust KVP is uh, the, the turns on the primary side are pretty much set. The turns on the secondary side, we can change, okay? So what we're actually doing whenever we adjust KVP is we're changing those turns on the secondary side. We're either squeezing them together or we're spreading them out. In doing that, we're increasing or decreasing our KVP, okay? Has to work off of alternating current. Uh, if we don't use alternating current, then we don't get that changing magnetic field. If we don't get the changing magnetic field, nothing's gonna happen, right? So it works off transformer law, which basically means that the more turns that we have on the secondary side, the higher the voltage is gonna be. It's proportional. Right? If we double the number of turns on the secondary side compared to the primary side, then our voltage is going to go up proportionally. We double it, and we're going to get a doubling of it. Right? So um, it's, it's proportional. We call the, the, meet, the meter that measures our voltage a pre-reading KVP meter. If you look on your control panel, you push the button, what does it say? The numbers go up and go down, but what does it say right there on the side? Does it say voltage? It says KVP, right? Right? So it says KVP even though it's reading in voltage because if our machine is set right, if our calibration is right, then whatever's coming out of the secondary side of that goes into the high voltage transformer, and the high voltage transformer does not have a variable range of turns on the primary side versus secondary side. This does. Variable resistor, rheostat, you can change it. What you feed into it is not usually going to be what you get out of it, right? But on your, um, on your, uh, on your high voltage transformer, it's a set turns ratio so that it never changes. And the, the voltage changes, but it changes only the turns ratio doesn't change, right? So it's predictable how much of a change in voltage you're gonna have at the high voltage transformer. It's always gonna be the same. Right? All right, so when we adjust our KVP, what happens? in the tube pre, before we make the exposure. First off, when do we get KVP? When does it actually happen? When it, during exposure, exactly. Whenever you, you hit the prep button, you don't have KVP. You have it set, but you don't have KVP until you hit the exposure button. So really, uh, pre-exposure, nothing really happens. It's at the point of exposure that those electrons jump and they accelerate from the cathode to the anode. The higher the KVP, the faster they go. The faster they go, the more kinetic energy they have. The more kinetic energy they have, the more energy they have to lose, and the more energy they have to lose, the higher the KVP is going to be, um, the, the higher the energy of your X-ray photons are going to be, right? So during exposure, we accelerate the electrons across the tube. So the higher the KVP, the faster they move. So how does that affect quality? We we'll just kind of walk through that. As KVP goes up, we can lose more kinetic energy, and that's how Brim's X-rays are created. The theory behind how Brim's X-rays are created: the more energy we have to lose, the more kinetic energy we lose, 
the higher the energy of the X-ray photons that we create, right? So high KVP gives us higher quality. Uh, but thinking about the brim spectrum, um, whenever we increase KVP, we don't discontinue making certain X-ray photons, right? The only thing that we do is we add, um, well, not the only thing that we do, one of the primary things that we do is we add more high energy and higher energy X-ray photons. But we're gonna increase all photon levels that we emit, right? So uh, quantity is gonna go up, right? So as we increase KVP, we increase quantity, even though we wanna think of quantity as mass, we increase KVP, we increase quantity, but because a 15% increase in KVP equals a 100% increase in mass, what can we say about the proportionality there? It goes in the same direction, right? Increase KVP, increase quantity, right? So it's directly related, but if 15% equals 100%, what do we call that? Is it direct? It goes in the same direction, so it's direct in that, that respect, but how is it related? Is it a direct relationship? 15% equals 100%. What does that mean? Exponential. Exponential. There you go. It's exponential. It's an exponential relationship. As you increase KVP, by, if you increase by 15%, then it goes up by 100%. <coughs> Right? So it affects quantity exponentially. It's directly related, or directly, yeah, directly related, exponentially proportional. Right? So how does it affect interactions? Ooh, there's a lot going on with interactions. So what do we say as you increase KVP last semester? What do we say as, as you increase KVP, what do you get more of? Penetration. Penetration, right? What else? Anything else? How about scatter? You remember talking, <laughs> I'm gonna mess your day up here. You remember talking about KVP and scatter radiation? As you increase KVP, what happens to scatter radiation? It increases. It, it, it increases. increases, right. As, and that's, that's kind of what we want you to be thinking, but it really does not. If we're talking about a percentage wise, as you increase KVP, interactions all the way across the board decrease. Ah, right? We lied to you for a whole semester. Well, not really, not really. Um, the, the net effect seems to be an increase in scatter radiation, but the reason that it seems to be is because you decrease interactions all the way across the board, but what decreases quickest most is photoelectric. So let's say you create an x-ray beam that's got this many photoelectric interactions and this many uh, scatter radiation, you know, um, Compton, Thompson, whichever type you want to want to consider. You increase KVP and they both drop, okay? As you increase KVP though, what happens is your photoelectrics drop faster than your scatter photons. So what you're left with is a decrease in overall interactions, but what you're also left with is a higher percentage of scatter versus photoelectric. Okay, so we're gonna talk about that this semester. Uh, just wanna kind of plant a seed on that. So how does it affect the remnant beam? <clears throat> well, if it increases, <laughs> y'all gonna go home and have a drink. Uh, so how does it affect the remnant beam? If I increase KVP, it increases penetration, right? So how's that gonna affect the remnant beam? It's, it's gonna increase, right? So uh, what we get as we increase KVP is we might not get fully a, you know, if we increase our KVP by 15%, we might not fully get a, a doubling of what's created, but what you should have in the remnant beam is double what you had before you increased your KVP, okay? So how does that affect your image? Uh, again, you know, it's kind of a rub. It's not much. It's not good because the computer fixes everything, but 
Um, there is one indication that you use too high KVP or you overexposed, and that is your S number, index number, right? So your index number uh, is going to be an indication that you used either too much KVP, too much mass, maybe a combination thereof. But the problem with just using the index number to determine that is that it, it takes a look, and we'll talk about this later in the semester too, but it takes a look at the entire image. Uh, if you shot a hand on a you know, 16 by 16 image receptor and didn't collimate and you use the right technique because you're going to have so much dark area on that image, it's going to think that you over expose the patient where in fact you did not. So the, the actual look of the image might not change. So does that mean that it doesn't matter what KVP or mass you use? No. no. Why? Patient exposure, exactly. You want to use the proper KVP. Um, you want to use proper mass in order to, to make sure you minimize patient exposure. Now you can manipulate KVP to manipulate patient dose. Uh, and almost universally, it's gonna be increased KVP and a reduced reduction in mass in order to affect that, <clears throat> okay? So the brim spectrum, KVP and brim spectrum, as we increase from 72 KVP to 82 KVP, what we get is, remember the area under the spectrum represents uh, the numbers, it's just numbers. Peak energy is down here. What does that little thing right there represent? Characteristic, Characteristic right. So if, if you're looking at, and it's awfully high for that, but uh, if, if you're looking at a brim spectrum that does not have that, then what do you know about that? It's not very high KVP, right? It's below 69 KVP. So uh, we get an in, with the increase in KVP, we get an increase in numbers, we get an increase in peak energy, it shifts the average. Remember, the average is represented by the peak of that, that bubble, and it pushes that towards the high energy side. So everything goes up, with the exception of this over here. The, the minimum energy remains unchanged. You remember what is the only thing that affects the minimum, minimum energy? Filtration. Filtration, right. So as we increase filtration, then what we're going to do is get rid of more and more of those low energy x-ray photons. But KVP otherwise affects everything all the way across the board. Numbers, peak energy, average, uh, affects everything. So it's a direct relationship as KVP increases. It's a direct relationship. We get an increase in output, but it pushes everything towards the high energy side, increases the average, increases the peak energy. KVP is the only thing that affects the peak energy. It's the only thing that affects whether or not we're going to get a characteristic spike. It does everything, right? But what we want to use it for primarily is penetration. We don't, we don't really at this point want to use it for uh, things like pathology. Um, you know, if, if we had an additive pathology, which is something that adds tissue density, we don't want to use uh, well, thickness. Let's go with thickness. If we have a hypersthenic patient versus an asthenic patient, we don't want to use KVP uh, to compensate for that patient because as we increase KVP, we increase the ratio of scatter to photoelectrics, right? So we have the appearance of greater scatter radiation, but also with a thicker patient, what do we create more of? Noise. Noise specifically. Type of noise would be fog. Fog is scatter. scatter. So we're compounding scatter. Okay, so this is where I think uh, technique formulation is going to go, though. All right, so I already talked about density and contrast, and density and contrast in context of KVP. How did KVP affect the density and contrast on your image? Higher KVP. Higher KVP should be higher, used to be higher density, lower contrast, okay. but really what controls both of those things now? Mass. <laughs> used to. Used to be mass. Used, used to be mass in, in uh, density. <laughs> Time's part of mass. The computer, right? Computer does it all. You make an image, 
Uh, you could choose chest x-ray at 50 kvp and the computer is going to make it look relatively decent. Don't ever shoot a chest x-ray at 50 kvp, but <laughs> theoretically you could. You, you know, down in the lab you could shoot Matilda at 50 kvp and it's going to come out looking pretty decent. Right? So, <clears throat> if kvp really doesn't affect contrast anymore, you know, regardless of what the scatter creation is, then why not adjust kvp for changes in patient size, changes in pathology, changes in everything. Why not do it? It's a valid question. I, you know, it's not a trick question. It's a valid question. And my answer is I have no idea. Uh, the, sometimes uh, clinical practice lags behind the technology a bit, but I think probably, you know, I keep saying this uh, at 10 years, but you know, I, and every year I keep saying it and, you know, nine years goes and eight years and, and whatnot. But I'd say within the next 10 years, KVP is going to be your, your technical factor of choice because it really doesn't affect the image. And the, the closer they dial in um, the computer processing, the more, uh, I don't say irrelevant, but the, the more, um, or the less likely KVP is going to affect the, the outcome of the image as much. So let's go back to this again. Oops, wrong way. We'll talk about that too. But uh, okay, so remnant beam. How does it affect the remnant beam? As we increase KVP, how does it affect the remnant beam? Greater <clears throat> penetration. Greater penetration. We're going to have more photons in the remnant beam, right? So. If we increase our KV, if we want to maintain the image receptor, this is the last thing we'll do, we're almost out of time, but if we want to maintain the image receptor uh, exposure, and let's say we have a patient we want to minimize radiation dose on, um, what kind of technique do you use if you want to minimize patient, um, patient exposure, patient low, dose? Low mass. High low KVP. mass, right? High KVP. Right? So if you have a pediatric patient, um, sometimes what you'll see in the pediatric department is that, you know, for, for size, uh, what we'll use is a higher KVP and a lower mass value. Because pediatric patients still developing, you know, the bone marrow, breast tissue is, is highly sensitive. Uh, pregnant patients, same thing. So we'll use a higher KVP and a lower mass value. Okay? So um, if we increase our KVP by 15%, then we can use a change in mass, how much of a change in mass we're going to use if we increase KVP by 15%. 100%. Well, 100% would be zero. So uh, if, yeah. you know, it gets, yeah. the, percentage, the percentages get kind of confusing. If you decrease your KVP by 15%, you would have to increase your mass by a factor of two, which is a 100% increase, right? But if you increase your KVP by 15%, you would reduce your mass by a factor of two, but now that's 50%, okay? So on your test questions, what you're gonna see is um, they're, they're gonna come at you from a, a number of different directions. And not necessarily on this test, but you know, certainly deeper we get into the semester. You gotta read the question carefully. What is it you're trying to, to what, if, what change are you trying to affect, right? So you get a test question that says, uh, you get a, a, a pregnant patient that you, for whatever reason, you have to do a KUB on. As we do sometimes, in a rare instance, we'll do uh, contrast studies on pregnant patients whose ureters are compressed by the baby, okay? It's rare, happens once in a while. So do you want to use low KVP and high mass on that patient? No, we're going to do limited study. We're going to use very high KVP, higher KVP, and a lower mass value. Okay, so you're reading your question, and that should be, you know, dose should be an alert to you. You want to limit the patient's exposure. Increase KVP, decrease mass, okay? You want to, in, Okay, so that's one, one way that it will come at you. Another way would be you want to increase image receptor exposure using KVP. 
Now what? As you increase KVP, what do you get in the remnant beam? More good. More, right. So you want to increase image receptor exposure using KVP. In the first case, we increase KVP, to limit dose, we increase KVP and reduce mass. Now we're going to do what with KVP? Increase. We want to increase image receptor exposure. So we want to increase the amount in the remnant beam. So what are we going to do? Increase, but what are we going to do with mass? Nothing, nothing, right? So read the, the, the questions carefully. What change are you trying to affect? Are you trying to, to decrease patient dose? If you're trying to decrease patient dose, it's gonna be increasing KVP and reduction of mass, right? If you're trying to maintain the image receptor exposure, it's gonna be increased KVP and decreased mass. If you're trying to increase image receptor exposure, it's gonna be increased KVP, no change in mass. Okay, so back to, to things like an additive condition. Let's say you got a patient that, um, that uh, I don't know, they've, they've got osteopetrosis. Okay, you know what osteopetrosis is? We, I, I think we touched on it last semester, but it's pretty much the opposite radiographically of osteoporosis, which you may be a little bit more familiar with. Osteoporosis, what is that? Yeah, bone density goes down, right? So osteopetrosis would be bone density goes up, right? So you want to uh, increase uh, the, let's see, because of the patient's pathology. It's an additive condition, um, and the addition is not soft tissue, then what would be your technical factor of, of choice? Would it be mass? Possibly KVP, right? So a lot of things wrapped up in KVP. Uh, most of the time your, your questions are gonna be uh, changes in image receptor exposure using KVP or uh, changes in patient exposure using KVP, okay? Do you wanna increase exposure? Do you wanna decrease exposure? Do you wanna maintain exposure? Okay, any questions? Is our first test going to be mostly about that, like what increases and what decreases? No, it's mainly going to be uh, more of what we talked about last semester. Uh, we're going to hammer this again, um, I think, in the fourth second test. Yeah. <laughs>